Let's start with two clouds. Each can be from any of the three major vendors. Here's a high-level view of a common workflow performed with the Snowflake platform. You have a large set of files that you load into a Snowflake table that a user can query. Now we'll look at a lower level view of this same workflow. We have two object storage containers. An external stage is a pointer to one of the containers, along with the credentials needed to access it. The stage is full of files in an open format, like Parquet or Avro. The Snowflake load process transforms our data into files that conform to Snowflake's proprietary format. A Snowflake table is a set of pointers to these files, and folks use standard SQL to query the table. Now here's an alternative workflow. An external table defines the layout and format of our staged files, and we can query the external table directly without loading it into Snowflake first. Sounds good, but the Snowflake documentation makes it clear that this functionality is primarily for performing simple queries only and is not intended to replace loading data into Snowflake tables. After running some of my own tests, what I'll say about querying external tables is, just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Snowflake also clearly documents drastic limitations on the SQL you should use to query external tables and I'll demonstrate those rules later. First, let's look at a motivating example. I obtained data for a billion and a half taxi trips from a New York City government agency. I uploaded the data as Parquet files into Azure Data Lake Storage, which provides file system semantics on top of object storage containers. My storage account is located in Azure's East US2 region. Nearly 68 gigabytes of data was spread across just over 2,700 Parquet files. Because folks love to work with CSVs, I also loaded the exact same dataset into another ADLS directory using the CSV file format. Since CSV text files are not binary compressed files like Parquet, the CSV used nearly three times as much space as the Parquet files, which is a big disadvantage for storage cost and compute speed. To keep things unbiased, my Snowflake account is also located in Azure's East US2 region. I loaded the Parquet files into Snowflake. When I created the Parquet and Snowflake files, I used default options, but notice that the 68 gigabytes of Parquet files got transformed into 45 gigabytes of Snowflake files a 33% decrease in storage, which is our first big advantage. Here's the SQL query I tested first. It's not very complex, but it is interesting. When I ran this against the Snowflake table, it took about six seconds to complete. I used the smallest compute size for this test and decided to use an extra small cluster for all tests to make it easy to compare costs. For all my tests, I shut off access to the query result cache. And I use a fresh cluster for each test to ensure local cache was empty. So the data had to be retrieved from remote storage. Therefore, in those six seconds, the cluster woke up, metadata was used to locate the required micropartition files and to generate a query plan, the plan was executed, data was retrieved from remote storage, then the result set was computed and returned to the user. I ran the same query again, but this time it accessed the Parquet external table, and it completed in 4 minutes and 39 seconds, which is about 47 times slower than querying the Snowflake internal table. And since compute usage is billed on a per second basis, it's 47 times more expensive. Then I ran the same query again, but this time it accessed the CSV external table, and it completed in 38 and a half minutes, which is 385 times slower than querying the Snowflake internal table. Just how you shouldn't feed human food to a dog because it will make the dog sick, 
you shouldn't feed human readable data to a cluster because it'll make the cluster slow. So I'm just going to stop talking about CSV files. Now that we're sufficiently motivated, let's dive into some details. Simply computing the number of rows in each table will help illustrate the importance of metadata and where the metadata is located. A query for the row count of my Snowflake table got answered in milliseconds because the answer was obtained from metadata statistics, which were retrieved from a high-speed database in the cloud services layer. A row count on the Parquet external table took over a minute and a half. The answer was obtained from metadata, but the metadata is located inside the Parquet files, which are far away in object storage. Our next lesson concerns select star queries. This seemingly innocuous statement really packs a punch. Snowflake's variant is a custom data type that can store data of any other type. Value is a variant column that contains a Snowflake object type, which is similar to a Python dictionary. So when I run this select star query, the first column is an unordered collection of key value pairs with a pair for every column. Imagine how inefficient it is to transport data for every row where every column name is repeated as a string in each record. Using an external table doesn't necessarily require less setup work either. When I created the external table object, I had to define virtual columns by casting each path within value so that I could submit SQL statements that simply reference column names. When I scroll to the right, you can see the individual columns are listed after the long value column. When we look at the query profile, we can see that all one and a half billion rows were copied from remote storage. The all here is the harsh part of this rule. Even though we use this predicate to try to limit the amount of data sent back from object storage, it did not work because of the select star rule. The compute cluster had to execute a filter operator to reduce the set down to just the 178 million rows for 2012. In contrast, when I select some of the virtual columns, instead of doing a select star, all one and a half billion rows were not sent from remote storage. Instead, the predicate worked remotely this time. So we had row pruning and column pruning. The reason we can have remote pruning is because of the Parquet metadata. For each column within each row group, there is metadata like this. In this case, Snowflake could see that the rows in this particular row group have integer values in their pickup year column, which are all equal to 2012. So we can have row pruning with external Parquet tables, but they still work a lot slower than internal Snowflake tables because every Parquet file has to be accessed so that their metadata can be read. We'll go back to our motivating example to discuss the SQL limitations I mentioned earlier. When you query an internal Snowflake table, you can use all the standard SQL predicates to filter your result set like these expressions. However, when you query an external Parquet table, you are severely limited by which predicates you can use if you want to take advantage of row pruning at the remote storage layer. You are limited to using these three comparison operators, the three Boolean operators, and, or, not, the starts with function, and that's it. You can use other standard SQL predicates, but they will seriously slow down your Parquet queries. Let's take a look at why this is. In this Parquet query, these last six predicates violate the rules. This is the only predicate that will enable remote row pruning. Pickup year equals 2012 initiates a subquery on remote storage that produces the same result set as this query. So that data from these columns will be sent to the compute cluster for the 178 million rows from 2012. 
Therefore, we only have partial remote row pruning. Then a filter operator will process the other six predicates on the compute cluster to reduce the set down to 83 million rows. We can contrast this with running the same query against an internal snowflake table. All seven of the predicates get applied remotely, so columns for only 83 million rows get sent to the compute cluster. Another important thing to understand is that internal and external tables can be kept in the same schema. For demonstration purposes, I named my tables so you can easily see which ones are external. But in the real world, they're more likely to be named something like this. When a user looks to see which tables are available, if they don't see this small external table label, they won't know to limit their SQL predicate usage. There's not much difference between this small label and this small label for internal tables. I'll conclude by listing a few more disadvantages of querying external tables. You cannot use external tables with popular Snowflake features like time travel, zero copy cloning, and database replication. External tables are read only, so you cannot update or delete their data from Snowflake. And since Snowflake doesn't manage external tables, their data quality is unknown during query operations. So if an error occurs during a table scan, the bad file is skipped and scanning just continues with the next file. All things considered, I think it's best to use external tables when you need to profile a source data set before creating a pipeline to ingest it into Snowflake. There seems to be too many disadvantages for widespread use beyond this.